unlike the first assignment, which was all about the materials that we use, um, organic material and objects, now we're looking at form. So we're looking at organic form, which is forms that are derived from nature, and structural forms that are made by humans. So this is a two-part project, both organic form and structural form, making one of each. Or like the first project, if you want to combine them into one larger project, uh, that's perfectly okay. So to begin with, we'll look at a number of organic forms that might inspire you. Things from the ocean, like jellyfish, they are a good source to begin with. Seahorses can give you quite interesting and complex forms. The puffer fish is something that's quite lovely and maybe even a little bit comical. The blobfish isn't always considered the most beautiful, but I think it's one of the most interesting of sea forms. This cute little animal actually came from an isolated cave. What you see here are the pathways created in a particle accelerator when two particles are smashed together at roughly the speed of light. Bubbles under the ice might be where you start looking. They look almost a little bit architectural in a weird scientific or science fiction way. A really long beard um, combed in an unusual way might be your source of inspiration. I always found leaf skeletons to be some of the most interesting of forms. And when a leaf decays, first the uh, material between the structure will disappear and then finally the skeleton. I'm not sure really if this is an eyeball or an egg, but it is something that's been magnified a little bit. When we look at the name of this um, being, it's called a slime mold, which doesn't suggest any beauty. But I think actually some slime molds create some of the more interesting forms in nature. Here's another slime mold that's growing on, on a tree. I think you've seen this one. This is sort of when cherry blossoms fall in Japan at a certain time of the year and they coat everything with these red petals. In mushrooms, we find some of the more compelling forms in nature. Sometimes when things like shells, such as the nautilus shell, are cut into sections and you see the inside of it, you can find some very incredible forms. If you have access to a scanning electron microscope or another electron microscope, you can magnify things and uh, see some very interesting forms. Uh, this, by the way, are some pollen grains. This looks like a bit of a sea creature from SpongeBob, but actually it's a virus looked at under an electron microscope. And these, I think, are pores that are seen on the underside of a leaf under a microscope. Other funguses might be an inspiration to your organic form. And in this sense, we can see the use of multiples as a possibility. Carrot love might be an interesting thing to think about. Sometimes landforms like this one found, which I think is Mesa in the southern United States, um, where you see all these really interesting mineral deposits that have been leached out by water dripping down. You've seen this form before. That's caused by billions of spiders migrating into trees and building um, webs during times of flood. This is a bit hard to guess what it is, but these are actually forms in snow created by uh, meltwater running into these rivers, the, all the tributaries that eventually add to this one river and they flow to larger rivers. These are the strange mounds created in Mono Lake in California, and uh, they're made from minerals continually added to these forms whenever it floods. And some things are additive, like the above slide, and some are subtractive. And this is erosion in Bryce National Park in Utah. I think one of the most interesting forms in the world are um, termite mounds. Not just because of how they look, but the way that termites actually create two layers that allow um, air conditioning through the act of convection. So they always have nice, cool apartments, these termites. And sometimes termites build really large, elegant uh, condo units. 
The image on the left shows the interior of the termite mound and how the convection works. And this principle has actually been used by a number of architects in heating and cooling their buildings. There's an interesting type of organic formation that you can find on the big island of Hawaii in areas of volcanic activity. And this is where lava comes in and the lava flow coats the base of trees and before it burns them out it forms these columns that at some point they can look a little bit like architectural forms. I visited this site um, sometime after this event, this exact spot, and photographed a number of these lava trees. But I thought this scene was more interesting. And the last of our organic forms are things that you could find in hot springs all over the world where there's an incredible sort of array of different forms that are neither erosion, um, well, they're kind of additive really. Now we can look at various artworks that are inspired by organic form. One of the most famous land art pieces um, in the world is the Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson. And the spiral is actually a form that keeps repeating itself over and over in nature, whether it's landforms, subatomic particles moving around, or in plants. This is kind of a strange turkey made by Tim Hawkinson, and it's got a wire frame inside, and it's actually, it's either turkey skin or chicken skin that covers it. Some of my students made this in California. It's actually a lava lamp, and it's got wax in it and a light bulb that would heat things up, and it sort of worked a little bit, but I thought that the forms uh, they created were interesting. That's in a bubblegum dispenser. A group called the Art Guys made these strange pencil things um, into flowers. I think this is an Andy Goldsworthy piece where he also worked with the spiral motif, um, creating it out of stacking rocks um, on the flat sides. Another student made this strange um, project out. It's a portrait of a mouse made out of mouse traps, feathers, and pennies. It had quite a long complex meaning, but I thought it was also an interesting sculpture. One of my former students from quite a number of years ago did this project where she vacuum packed various people, including her instructor. That's me in there. And it was all about kind of the notion of preserving and conserving things brought to an absurd level. It was actually an enjoyable thing, and she had a small mouthpiece that you could breathe with. Another student of mine from California made a landscape um, out of air fresheners inside of her car, and she said that she had to stop driving this around because she'd get really kind of stoned just from the vapors uh, from these air fresheners. Another student, Nina Jun in California, made this mound out of pine needles. And it kind of represented uh, the burial mounds that you find all over Korea. But she wanted it also to represent a pregnant belly and talk about the voyage from birth to death. This is a work called Clouds by Tony Craig, and it shows these um, clouds coming out of these big electrical generators um, in England, and he casts this in steel, and the whole notion of clouds made out of steel is an interesting reversal of the type of form. The artist Gabriel Orozco had a very simple way of making a kind of recognizable form. And so here he made a heart out of clay. And still on the subject matter of hearts, the artist Jan Faber made this quite large heart. It's about two meters high out of dirt and bits of trees. And this other quite lovely heart shape was made out of um, cut paper. Um, I'm not sure if it represented a heart or even more of kind of a butterfly. A friend of mine from California, who was one of my co-teachers, Carol Shaw Sutton, works with fibers, and she likes to derive a lot of her forms from nature. So, of course, this is kind of a shell that also made a cornucopia. This was quite an elegant spiral piece that she made, um, and it 
went along with this video projection of the cosmos. So there was kind of the suggestion that this here might be patterned after a, a spiral galaxy. And here are a few more structures created by Carroll, um, again using various forms of fibers and reeds. This is another work made by Carroll um, out of electrical cables, which had a much different feel to it. Another friend of mine, Twyla Exner, um, also used electrical wires and often looked at roots and structures of plants in terms of uh, futuristic um, integration of these things. And her structures resemble organic things, but you're never quite sure what. And here's Twyla with some strange organic forms that she turned into something wearable. The artist Yayoi Kusama from Japan worked with um, a whole array of different organic forms and often resorted to the polka dot um, surface of many, th many of the things that she made. Kusama is very well known for creating these infinity boxes that are made completely of mirrors. And as they reflect into each other, they create these spaces that look like you are looking into infinity. And they're quite something to stand inside of. Um, in, this, in this particular one, she uses the motif of the pumpkins with polka dots, which is a very common motif of hers. In some of her infinity rooms, she just included a lot of lights. And it really felt like being somewhere out in the cosmos in a kind of orderly way. Organic form can certainly influence architecture, and here's an example of the ceiling of a mosque in Istanbul that uses a lot of motifs that suggest organic form. One of the aspects of the organic forms is you have to include some sort of interesting surface on it. And here are some examples of interesting uh, surfaces that we see in some sculptures. This work, Wave UFO by Mariko Mori, uses a very slick surface to uh, uh, speak about futurism and perhaps speed out in space. It had a soundtrack that in some ways mimicked the exterior. Mike Kelly made some of his versions of Frankenstein, and one of them was covered with these really interesting, beautiful little bits, including some candies and things like watches and that. And the other one had these very dull plastery types of um, pebbles and things like that on them. This very large head made by the artist Zhang Huan is made entirely out of ash that he gathered from monasteries in China. And uh, it's actually the ash that comes from incense sticks that monks would burn while they were praying. It stands about two and a half meters high. Kitsch is a form of aesthetics that refers to popular bad taste, and it often works alongside popular culture. You see a lot of examples of architectural kitsch, such as this Randy's Donuts, which is a donut shop uh, quite close to where I used to live in uh, Long Beach in California. So this is the type of kitsch that's not really created by an artist, but just it's sort of a popular way of attracting attention to um, one's store. Jeff Koons is an artist who uses the idea of kitsch quite frequently, such as in this balloon dog, which is about four meters high. It's quite a large piece, but it's not really a balloon. It's made out of highly polished anodized steel to give it that color and the shine. His work is quite often both really kitschy and quite beautiful. And his giant puppy, which was about 40 feet high, entirely covered with flowers, is one of his most famous examples of kitsch art. When artists use kitsch, they're generally fully aware of the aesthetic um, direction that they are following. Sandy Skogland is an artist who creates these life-size tableaus that are not photoshopped at all they're just simply the color they are so this was a room that was entirely gray with gray dressed um, performers or actors and these foxes are painted this brilliant orange and so it photographs like this although it does look like a digital compilation 
Oliver Herring is an artist who does figurative work and he creates a surface by taking hundreds if not thousands of photographs of the model and then applying them to a, a styrofoam form. That makes it lifelike in an eerie sort of way. We've seen other similar works by Anish Kapoor where he would make these organic looking forms and cover them with a coating of very dense pigment that had bright colors to it. So rather than looking painted, it had kind of a powdery look. And this is a work I think we saw earlier, but from a different perspective, um, A Kitchen by Liza Lou, where absolutely everything in there is covered with beads. And here you can see some of the objects in the kitchen, like her potato chips and Budweiser beer, again, all made out of beads. The artist Hervé Yumbi created these celestial masks that are based both in contemporary sculpture and traditional mask making and beadwork. And they were hung up in a tree so that you could actually look up and giving them sort of a celestial feel. And here you can see a close up of one of the masks also covered entirely with beads in a much different way than Liza Lou would do. Another artist friend of mine, Janet Morton, um, liked to knit things. And here she covered all of these objects in the living room. These are life size with her knitted um, cozies and sweaters for things like vacuum cleaners and televisions. And here is a tree covering that a former student of mine in California did that is uh, crochet. You can create beautiful sheep exteriors using old telephone cables, back when telephones actually had wires stuck to them. The next three images show work that I saw at an exhibition a few years ago that was based on shamanism and ritual and the apparel. This is a regalia of a Naganga, or ceremonial healer, and it comes from the Congo, and you can see that it's over 100 years old. From the same exhibition, here is a shaman from Siberia in northern Russia. And all of those surface elements that you see have some sort of symbolic or spiritual significance. The particular ceremonies of these shamans were based very much in the dream world. From the same exhibition, here is a nail fetish that comes from the country of Benin. And the nail fetishes were objects used in the art of healing. And sometimes the process of making them was several hundred years as they were used over and over again. And for example, in this one, you could see some ancient hand forged nails and you could see a modern watch. Another excellent example of a cultural use of color and texture can be found at the annual powwow in Kamloops. It is considered one of the premier powwows in North America, and you can see a number of the top dancers in the world in this particular form of cultural expression. When considering the surface qualities of your sculpture, you want to take into account color. Color can be used as a strong compositional element, or it can convey meaning, symbol, or emotional qualities. The Great Film Hero by Zhang Yimou is an excellent example of use of color for creating emotional tone. And each scene used a different color palette to create the setting. Here you can see in a pride parade, the multicolored hues have a lot of symbolic importance, not to mention creating a very beautiful and lively parade. And the extensive scale of this um, rainbow flag can also symbolize bringing together in unity. Colors can have meaning both in the word and the actual color, as seen in a number of recent protests around the world and in the U.S. The color orange also recently became a very strong symbol in commemorating missing Indigenous children in the Every Child Matters movement. The color green can symbolize an environmental or ecological movement with its obvious um, reference to nature, but it can also be used in a parade to signify St. Patrick's Day, which is of course an important holiday for Ireland. And of course, it's the color of the Green Party, 
which is of course the party whose platform is environmental concerns. Certain colors like the color red can bring out very intense passions such as the supporters of the Liverpool Football Club after they won the Champions League and of course the supporters of national football clubs such as Senegal when they were competing in the most recent World Cup and seen here of course are the colors inherent in their flag. So of course all national flags are about the particular structural arrangement of the various colors within each flag. Some countries opt for quite a boring structure like the French flag that if you just turn sideways you get the Dutch flag. But those three colors arranged in a different pattern take on a different meaning as some countries flags show their colonial roots. Oh, the New Zealand flag has the Union Jack in it signifying that they were once a British colony. Canada also used to have the Union Jack as its flag by the way. So a number of people have thought that they should rectify this issue of having the Union Jack and their flag in New Zealand and here are some of the proposed changes. Here's a version of a possible New Zealand flag created by the artist Hunert Wasser who is in fact from Austria and it takes a symbol from Maori culture which does indicate the frond of a fern. This by the way is a work of architecture by Hunert Wasser which shows the combination of plants and structure which would be a good example of uh, perhaps one of your current assignments. One of the things about organic form and particularly if you want to do some mold making is the use of the repeated form or the multiple where you can make forms over and over and over again and create quite a mass of forms. So this is a project by the artist Alan McCollum that has some 10,000 different forms in it and um, they all look different but some of the re forms repeat um, after some time. And this is another work by uh, Anthony Gormley. All of these little figures which he made um, with a family in Mexico and there's actually over 50,000 of these small figures and when you come into the gallery they're just standing there staring at you like they want something. And here's a close-up of some of them. It was actually quite creepy but at the same time I found quite enjoyable. And this artwork shows uh, multiple mushrooms. Now these are actually real mushrooms that were glued to the floor and they wanted it to look like a uh, kind of a mushroom patch and it was in a show called Ecstasy and it was all about hallucinogens. So these are all actually magic mushrooms and needless to say there was kind of a guard standing near this uh, piece. So here we're looking at structural form and as an inspiration you can often look to things like architecture or it could be something like furniture. Uh, you don't have to do architectural models but that's kind of a good place to start in terms of how you think about this. And the very famous glass house by Philip Johnson. Um, I think it'd be cool to live in here but I sometimes want some curtains. Here's an apartment block that has a very interesting negative space in the middle of it. As far as I know, uh, this is in Paris, but I couldn't say for sure. This is another work by the architect Hundert Wasser where he includes both plants and building in this structure. And he often bases his structures on various organic forms. I saw this in Darmstadt, Germany a couple of years ago. This is called the Spiralwald, which means spiral forest. And here's another view of the Spiralwald. You could actually walk up the roof and there were various little cafes and resting spots along the way. This is a giant structure in Sevilla, uh, Spain, and it's made entirely out of wood. And I don't really know what the function of it is, but it, uh, it almost resembles a bridge, but it's not quite. And this is a famous bridge in Budapest. I, and I think bridges um, is, are a really good example of um, very interesting and elegant forms that you can find throughout the world. Now they're not necessarily built for beauty but I think the very function of them is what creates the aesthetic interest. Uh, Jordan, a former student from here, would build these 
uh, models of houses that were either half or one third the size and kind of build the underlying structure of them. The artist Andrea Zittel would actually create these kind of living pods um, that were completely self-contained in that someone could actually just plunk somewhere and live in. It would include a small kitchen, a bed, and a living room. And uh, this is an interesting form created by the Russian artist Ilya Kabakov, who would build structures inside of structures. And this was kind of a spiral building that actually functioned almost like a tent because it was covered with this very flimsy kind of paper. This is a work by the artist Dennis Oppenheim. Um, some of you, if you know Vancouver at all, you would recognize it was on the waterfront at some point, and he just simply took this church and he inverted it. And here's another form of a disappearing church. Uh, this is a church in um, Belgium, and it's called Reading Between the Lines. And depending on which um, direction you view this church from, it either is fairly solid or it almost entirely disappears. And here is a perspective that's fairly solid, but you see parts of it are disappearing. And from this vantage point, it has almost completely disappeared. And from some of the other vantages, vantage points, you can barely see anything at all. Now this actually is a functioning church and it is used. Here you can see it quite a lot less substantial. And some of the forms, particularly in architecture, are kind of between the organic and the structure. And although this is a two-part project, um, you can once again do some form of hybrid that includes both organic and structural elements. So this is the art museum in Graz in Germany, uh, sorry, in Austria, uh, the same place that one of the bridges was. And um, this looked like, um, from different vantage points, it looked like a giant alien slug had landed in this very beautiful medieval city. And it had all these kind of antennae on the top. Those were actually the windows. The Great Mosque in Jenny Ma in Mali is made almost entirely out of mud, and it's um, built within a climate that would allow mud buildings, which can have a great deal of strength depending on what they're mixed in with. And this is quite a typical um, piece of architecture by the Dogon people who live in this part of Mali. And here's another view of one of these massive structures with some of the housing from the local city in the foreground. The houses in Gurunzi villages are also made out of earth and mud. And each of them are painted in these very elaborate abstract design patterns. And entire villages can look like this. Here's another image from a Gurunzi village. And the Gurunzi live primarily in Burkina Faso and in Ghana. This is the ceiling in a church that uses the spiral form, which is found both in nature and in structural forms. Um, and it kind of spirals one to look up into the heavens. And here's another architectural interior that kind of combines both the organic and the structural in terms of its inspiration. Here's another large uh, sculpture that used inflatable plastic with kind of these tight bands around it. And it looked both kind of organic and structural. It's quite large, actually. But it only functioned as a sculpture and not as a piece of architecture. And here's a piece of architecture in a city in China, I'm not sure which city, that is made out of all these really strange panels that makes it look like the carapace or the surface of an animal, something like an armadillo. I don't think that's the inspiration for it, but it has that look. This is kind of a wooden bench made by one artist that combines both structural and organic form. And here's an enormous wooden structure made for Burning Man, which of course is going to be burnt by the end of this festival. Personally, I think it's a bit of a waste of wood, but it would still be quite spectacular. One of your options might be to make a diorama um, to combine the organic and structural form into one piece. Dioramas are miniature scenes or landscapes. Here's a very simple diorama made out of paper 
and lighting in the background. This was a diorama that was in on somebody's desk, and I guess it comes from that idea of dreaming about going somewhere else while you're sitting at your desk. Here's a small diorama made by a former student of mine that was a small island in resin to look like water, and it had lights on it that would change colors, signifying a change in time and a change in season. And here you can see it with the color change. Here's another one of her small dioramas that was uh, a wall work that had a video projection on it. And in the video projection, you would see things like cloud shadows passing and the shadows of birds passing. Here's a diorama by the artist um, Greg Crutzen, and he made his dioramas only for the photograph. You never actually saw the diorama. And so this had a lot of different scales in it. At the front, those birds would be life size, and in the building, um, those buildings in the back would be miniature and the mountains would just be painted. The artist James Casimir also made these architectural interiors that always look flooded and they also were just for the photograph. They didn't exist as individual art pieces. Here's another one of his interiors and because they were so meticulously done they actually looked like um, life-size architecture but these were all dollhouse sized um, architectural forms. The artist Thomas Demand also made these dioramas um, only for photographs and these are made entirely out of paper and for this um, you could see that the lighting was really important. So if you're a photographer this would be an inter interesting project creating these that exist only as photographs. So a number of artists make these miniature dioramas in cities and put them in opportune places that take advantage of the architectural elements, such as that hole, which makes a nice roadway tunnel. This is the Bosch bus by the artist Kim Adams that's in the Hamilton Art Gallery, built on a real old Volkswagen bus. And his landscape here is actually quite extensive, while well, it's really a cityscape. And it plays with the idea of scale because all different parts of it work on a completely different scale. And here's one more part of his Bosch bus. This is a homework project due on February 25th, and you can email it to me. And it is five to 10 images of interesting organic forms plus five to 10 images of interesting structural forms. And you can just get these off the internet or you can take photographs yourself and then email them to me. Or submit them on Moodle and I will have a submission portal. On February 17th, we will be having a mold making demo and following here are some of the things that you will need for that demo. You'll need a small plastic container to make the mold in or to mix the material, petroleum jelly like Vaseline, a cheap paintbrush, and an object to make the mold out of. So you need your container to make the mold in, and it needs to be larger than half of your object. And this is the paintbrush and the Vaseline slash petroleum jelly, and some kind of object to cast, a little rubber duck might be pretty good or something like an apple that would fit that dish I just showed you. So you'll learn how to divide that um, object in half and what's the best way to actually put it into the mold. Now this would be the wrong way to do it. And this would be the correct uh, way to divide your apple in half and mold first one part and then the second part. I'll be showing you all of this in the demo, but anyways, here's the first half of your mold that will be using either plaster or alginate. And I'll show you which kind of objects wouldn't work very well in a mold, as there are too many bumps on it. Or something like this star fruit and how you could put that in a mold and get it out again. And so you think you'd kind of orient it like this, but that's not how. 
As you see, you wouldn't be able to pull it out of the plaster. This is how you would divide it. And that blue there, that is plaster. And here's kind of a representation of the star fruit in the plaster. That's just digital. That's not really plaster. Here's your rubber duck again. This would probably be too big. That's actually an inflated rubber duck. But if you did divide it in half, this wouldn't work because you wouldn't be able to pull the body out of the plaster. This would be the proper way if you did want to make a giant duck or a small duck. And that is how you, your two-part mold would work. So again, this mold might be made out of plaster or alginate. And we will be learning both materials. And in this assignment, you'll be learning to make both the negative, which is the mold made out of plaster or alginate, and the positive, which is the finished sculpture itself. So here are some videos that I will post, and also we will watch, but if you want to watch them on your own.